Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's an outstanding pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Ingrid Willard as Professor of Economics in the department of that name in our Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. She is also the Dean of our faculty. I welcome two of our Vice Rectors here this evening, Professor Nico Koopman and Professor Eugene Kluter, and a special word of welcome to, Prof to Professor Willard's family, her husband, Dr. Chris Willard, her daughter, Sarah, Professor Willard's parents, Professor Alko and Mrs. Mill Mayer, and Professor Willard's in-laws, Dennis and Martha Willard. Welcome also to friends of Professor Willard. I want to welcome a number of colleagues from UCT uh, who are here this evening. Welcome to colleagues from the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences and from elsewhere in our university. And I'm especially delighted to see that a number of our deans are here this evening. Welcome especially also to our students. An inaugural lecture is a milestone in, the, in an academic career, and it is a very happy milestone. As a faculty and as a university, we share in the joy of the occasion, and we honor a colleague who has achieved the highest of academic ranks. The academic career that, Professor Willard, uh, that brought Professor Willard to this lecture this evening started at the then University of Natal, now UKZN, where she graduated with a BSc degree in Mathematical Statistics and Economics in 1992. From there, she went straight to National Treasury for policy work. At this early stage, we can already see two features that will mark her career. First, an interest in economic policy and a commitment to rigorous policy analysis. And secondly, a commitment to using that policy analysis to advance the welfare of all South Africans. You will hear her return to these themes in her lecture this evening. While working at National Treasury, she studied towards an honors degree through UNISA, where she graduated in 1995. It was also in 1995 that I had the privilege to meet Professor Willard at a budget speech competition in Cape Town. She knew rather more about the budget than I did then as I am afraid to say is still the case. <laughs> she obtained her PhD from UCT in 2002, during which time she was senior research specialist at the HSRC after an earlier career at the Department of Economics at NMMU. As economists in the Western Cape, we were delighted when she moved to Soldru at UCT in 2005, where she also joined the School of Economics in 2008 and was promoted to Professor of Economics in 2014. She was the Dean of the Faculty of Commerce at UCT from 2016 until 2018, at which point it was our extraordinary good fortune that she was appointed as Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at Stellenbosch University. Ingrid is a widely cited scholar with a research focus on the measurement of poverty and inequality, unemployment, social protection, and fiscal policy. She remains a research associate at Saldru and is also an honorary professor of economics at UCT. She is also a research fellow of the Institute for the Study of Labor based in Bonn, a senior research associate at the United Nations University and a research associate of the Commitment to Equity, uh, the Commitment to Equity Institute at Tulane University in New Orleans. In 2015, Ingrid was the recipient of the Alan Pfeiffer Award the University of Cape Town Vice Chancellor's annual prize in recognition of outstanding welfare-related research that has demonstrated relevance to the advancement and welfare of South Africa's disadvantaged people. As is evident from her career path, Ingrid is strongly committed to providing research-led policy advice. From 2008 to 2014, she served on the Employment Conditions Commission which advised the, the South African Minister of Labor on making sectoral determinations concerning working conditions and minimum wages covering more than three million workers in sectors where collective bargaining is weak. From 2013 to 2018, Ingrid has served on the Davis Tax Committee, which advised um, uh, the Minister of Finance on tax reforms. Now, ladies and gentlemen, finally, Professor Woolard has the rare distinction of featuring in a Fred Maton cartoon in the burger in her role <laughs> as policy advisor to the Davis Tax Commission. Professor Willard, we are your eager audience and now wish to listen to you on the topic, Mind the Gap, 
income inequality in post-apartheid South Africa. So thank you very much for that very warm welcome, Stan. Um, this, is, this is indeed an auspicious occasion. Um, I, I came to Stellenbosch University primarily to, to be the Dean of Economic and Management Sciences, but it's incredibly important to me that I should have an academic home. And this evening is, is one of the occasions um, where we come together in, in my capacity as a member of the Economics Department, um, and, and that's, that's very special for me. So I'm going to talk at a very high level this evening about income inequality and some of the th things that we've learned about this topic in the past 25 years. I should say at the outset that my work in this area, much of which has been done with some of the people in this room, Julian May, um, Murray Leibrandt, Safas van den Berg, um, uh, my husband, Christopher Woolard, has been largely descriptive and diagnostic rather than policy prescriptive. While our work provides some pointers as to what issues need to be tackled, we typically stop short of suggesting specific policy interventions. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Ramey. <laughs> so I don't say, say this as a criticism or with regret. I actually think it is a strength of our work that we don't overreach into policy conclusions, which sometimes can come across as trite, but we rather put effort into ensuring that we describe accurately the extent and nature of, of inequality in a way that is truly consistent as a first step in the policy-making process. So I want to open with this quotation from, from, from Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz. Countries around the world provide frightening examples of what happens to societies when they reach the level of inequality towards which we are moving. It is not a pretty picture. Countries where the rich live in gated communities, waited upon by hordes of low-income workers, unstable political systems where populists Ramey, <laughs> it suddenly dawns on me that you can't see anything. Oh, now you can. <laughs> Apologies. I'm so sorry. I'm showing my age here, I suspect. Um, all right. Where was I? Let me start again with Joe Stiglitz. So countries around the world provide frightening examples of what happens to societies when they reach the level of inequality towards which we are moving. It is not a pretty picture. Countries where the rich live in gated communities, waged upon by hordes of low-income workers, unstable political systems where populists promise the masses a better life, only to disappoint. Perhaps most importantly, there is an absence of hope. In these countries, the poor know that their prospects of emerging from poverty, let alone making it to the top, are minuscule. This is not something we should be striving for. It is not difficult to relate the South African situation to the picture of a vastly unequal society provided here by Joe Stiglitz. These photos from, jo from Johnny Miller um, in an amazing collection called Unequal Spaces are a sobering visual representation of the inequality which stares us in the face every, every way we look in our daily lives. It is evident where we work, where our children go to school, and in the places where we live. So we have here a photograph of Imazama Yetu, Masipomerere, and finally, our own town of Stellenbosch. I seem to have also lost my water in the process. Oh, it's on this side, thank you. <laughs> so, why does inequality matter? That is a topic well beyond the scope of what I'm going to discuss this evening, but let me seed a few ideas with you. Firstly, we know that high income and wealth inequality retard social progress, intrinsically and instrumentally, in terms of improvements in well-being for people and the promotion of social cohesion. While some social inequality and economic differentiation is tolerable and even desirable, high inequality in resources, opportunities or capabilities runs counter to most theories of justice, which view such inequalities as inherently unfair. In addition, inequality is perceived to be undesirable, undesirable by the vast majority of people when you, ask whether, when you ask people about their preferences. It is a burden on the well-being of the poor, and it is associated with lower intergenerational social mobility. Instrumentally, high inequality increases poverty, it lowers the impact of economic growth on poverty reduction, it promotes social conflict, disaffection, and protest, as we saw in the quotation from Joe Stiglitz, 
It affects behavior that can trap poor people in a state of poverty and economic, and finally economic inequalities often promote social and political e uh, inequality. High economic inequality tends to lead to large inequalities in health and education, work that is um, much, a, a topic that is much studied in this particular economics department. And finally, we now know that high levels of inequality are associated with lower subsequent economic growth. So in my talk this evening, I'm going to show you quite a lot of empirical evidence that we've collected over the last two or three years, which built on a, on a body of work that spans the last 25 years. But I, all of this work that I'm going to present to you has as its basis household survey data. And I think sometimes we forget as researchers to think about exactly where that data comes from. We're presented with a data set which we possibly just download from the internet, and we don't necessarily give, give thought to what are the actual, under, what, you know, what are the origins of, of that information. So I've devoted a, a large part of my life to, to data collection. It's a very different part of my life. I'm not going to talk about in detail this evening. I could talk about any of these topic, topics for hours. But be, in order to collect data, one needs to go through a series of steps. You need to draw a sample. You need to design a questionnaire. You need to translate that questionnaire. You need to ensure that field workers understand it and communicate it effectively. You have to actually go to the field and collect, collect the data. You have to capture the data. You have to calculate weights. You have to impute missing values, construct aggregate variables, um, create some weights, and ultimately curate the data. And I think sometimes we forget that all of that stuff happened before we simply pressed a button and downloaded beautiful data from Data First. So I wanted to just show you three very quick photographs of, of some of the field work that, uh, that were taken, of three photos that were taken during, during field um, in the National Income Dynamics Study. This was, we, we, we collected five waves of data. These are photos from, from wave three. And um, the person you see there is Mbali Mokhamonyani. She was one of our fieldwork coordinators, and here she is pretty much in the middle of nowhere, really desperately wondering where exactly the homestead is that she's, she's trying to find. And I think it's, you know, one, 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 one forgets what goes into collecting that data. If you think about the fact that um, you send a, a field worker to a deep rural <laughs> rural area where then aren't necessarily roads, they can't, um, they sometimes have to park a, a great distance away, carry all the, all the anthropometric equipment or, and questionnaires and gifts and everything else with them, um, and then go in search of a household. And so sometimes it can be a truly soul-destroying <laughs> process. Um, um, uh, uh, and I, you know, it, it's a, it, I think it, we, we need to spend one moment thinking about that, because it's, Honestly, at the press of a button, you can then take data and produce a graph that looks like that. And forget about the fact that, that an awful lot of hard work went into designing that questionnaire and collecting the data in order that we as researchers can use it. So I, I added up that the cost of the data collection that, went, that is behind this graph is of the order of 300 million rand. Right? Um, and, but the fact is we wouldn't know this unless we, unless we went to that expense and that effort in order to collect the data. Okay, so that was my little, my little side, side tour into talking about where does data come from. And now we're going to, again, just you know, forget about that and assume it, it came down from heaven and, um, and it's all perfectly harmonized. It's all beautifully comparable um, because somebody else has, has done that hard work. So the thing that we now know is that poverty has fallen since 1993. So these are, these are, uh, are, are cumulative, uh, sorry, these are, 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 are uh, probability distributions um, of, of household income. So we assume that, household that income comes into the household and is then perfectly shared amongst all the people in the household. Lots of assumptions behind that, but again, let's, um, let's, let's park those methodological issues for a moment. And then what you see here is a very clear movement to the right over time. So the black curve that you see there is 1993, the pink curve is, two, is 2014, and it's very evident that not only has there been a rightward shift, but the left tail has moved significantly towards the right. So we know that poverty has fallen. However, it is not the case that inequality has changed very much um, post-1993. So what we do here is we divide the population up into 10 groups that we call deciles, so the poorest. Um, we, 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 take the, we take individual people. We assume that their well-being is reflected through the, the, their per capita, the per capita income of the household. So again, income comes into the household. It's perfectly shared amongst the individuals, and that, in, that, that income is attached to each person. We then rank people from, from poorest to richest and divide them into these 10 groups called deciles. 
So what you see there is this incredibly stark picture of inequality that really hasn't changed very much um, in the last, in the last 20, 25 odd years. So the first 40% of people, in other words, the people in deciles one to four, uh, together cumulatively uh, accrue about five or 6% of total income. The, the richest 10% of people are, are earning somewhere between 55 and 57% of income over time. So a very stark picture of income inequality. So I'm sure many of you know that often we, we, we talk about Gini coefficients in the inequality literature. I'm not sure if you necessarily know what a Gini coefficient is. So I, I, for those of you that don't, let me give you a, a very quick hand-waving explanation of what, a Gini, of what a Gini is. So again, um, we take everybody in our population, we rank them from poorest to richest, and we then draw a cumulative distribution um, of people, of, of, of a cumulative distribution of income uh, on, uh, in order to show the, the proportion of income accruing to each group, uh, to each group of, uh, in, the, in, in the population. So that red line that you see there is what we call the Lorenz curve. If you were to imagine a world in which everybody had, perfect, had exactly the same income, then one would be, one would be uh, in a world that, where the Lorenz curve was coincident with that blue line there, the line of perfect equality. So in other words, 50% of people earn 50% of the income. 70% of people earn 70% of the income. So the more, the more the, the Lorenz curve sags away from that blue line, the more unequal the society. So the Gini coefficient is simply, um, it's calculated simply by taking the area between the Lorenz curve and the line of perfect equality and dividing by the area under the curve. So again, in a world of perfect equality, one would have no, shape, no area between, between the blue and the red line and, and therefore one would have a Gini coefficient of zero. In a, in the other, at the other extreme, if you, had a, uh, if you had a society in which one person earned all of the income, one would have a Gini coefficient of one. So the Gini always lies between zero and one. The higher it is, the more unequal the society. So in that top left-hand corner, I, I, I show um, three calculated Genies for three of the data sets that we use. The, the Seldry data set from 1993, the project for statistics on living standards and development, the very first national household survey that we collected in South Africa, <coughs> data from, from NIDS, National Income Dynamics Survey, uh, Wave 1, 2008, and finally Wave 5 data from, from 2017. And so what you see there is perhaps a movement in the Gini, um, some of it might be measurement error, but certainly not, not big changes over time. One can look at South Africa in a global context, um, and when one does that, and I'm not going to talk about this, this picture in any detail, except to say that the darker the shading, the more unequal that country is. And South Africa routinely comes out um, in, these, in, these, uh, in these statistics as, as having the highest measured inequality in the world. So the darkest, darkest part of, 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 that, of that map. Okay, so I want to talk about two, two aspects of this inequality story. I want to first talk a little bit about the role that, that fiscal policy has in terms of, 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 of reducing income inequality, and then I'll talk very briefly about, about the labor market. So fiscal policy has many objectives. Um, primarily, the, 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 the aim is of, of, of taxation, for example, is in order to raise revenue, in order to, to spend it on, on all sorts of things that we need, policing, the army, um, schools, education, uh, schools, hospitals, for example. One objective of fiscal policy can be redistribution. Um, it, it, it's, and it's, it's never going to be the only goal, but certainly it, it can be one of the goals of fiscal policy. So we did a project a few years ago, and, and we're in the process of, of replicating that study to look at, in fact, we've done a few studies. Um, Safas is sitting over here, and Safas and uh, my husband Chris and I did, did one of these studies way back in, in 2004. Um, the work I'm going to show you this evening is from 2015, and as I say, we're currently trying to up update it again to try and see what is the impact of the tax and, and expenditure, expenditure systems in South Africa on reducing inequality. So I'm going to show you a couple of the findings without talking too much about the methodology. Um, it's enough to say that what we, in a very broad strokes, what we do is we take household survey data and we take fiscal data and we try and line these things up and we, we try and, and, and get a picture of, of what is the impact of, of, fiscal, of the fisc fiscal system on individual households. We make lots of modeling assumptions 
and we try and, and get a picture of, 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 of what the distributional impacts are, both of taxation and some expenditure items. So the first thing that we find, um, this, is, uh, this is from the updated work that um, I've been doing together with a student at UCT, Mashekwa Maboshi, uh, where we find that personal income taxes are highly progressive both in relative terms and importantly in absolute terms. So what this is showing here is that about 87% of personal income tax is paid by just 10% of households. And that of course is, is simply reflecting the underlying income distribution. So not only is, is so when you have a highly unequal society, you're going to by, by the definition have quite a narrow personal income tax base. But over and above that, we do find that the, that the, that personal income taxes are significantly more progressive than, than, than um, simply the underlying income distribution. So personal income taxes make up about one third of, of, of tax revenue, so this is a significant, uh, does have a significant impact on, on, on the overall picture. I'm not going to talk about indirect taxes in any detail except to say that what, what, we've, what we draw here are, are concentration curves, you can think of those in the same way as the Lorenz curve, in other words we show the cumulative distribution of taxation after we've ranked um, individuals according to their market income. And so what, what you see here, if I can get the kicker to work, after all my other technological hiccups, so what you see here is that, is that, is that VAT and, um, and, and the fuel levy almost perfectly track disposable income. So the share of, of, of the fuel levy and the, the share of VAT that you pay are almost a perfect mirror of, the, of, the of, the, of your disposable income, which in turn is a reasonable proxy for the income that you earn uh, very, in very broad terms. So what we find is that the fuel levy and VAT are broadly neutral. In other words, the proportion that, uh, that the, of the tax that you pay is very similar to the proportion of the income that you earn. That isn't true for excise duties. Excise duties... Um, you can see they are much less unequally distributed, so, which in effect means that they're much more regressive. So they, the, the impact of, 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 of the excise, of excise taxes on, on alcohol and tobacco are felt more, more acutely by, by poorer households. Which is not, at all, which is not to say that, that poorer people spend more on alcohol and tobacco. Um, people often assume that that's what this is saying. All it is saying is that as a proportion of your income, you are spending more on alcohol and tobacco. What we in fact find is that um, it is still the case that the excise duty collected from richer households is significantly higher. Right? So we still get more tax revenue from richer households, it's just a smaller proportion of their income than we, would, um, than we see at the, at the other end of the distribution. So we, we do this for, for a range of taxes. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about those in any detail. I want to talk very briefly about one or two items on the expenditure side of the budget. So the first thing I want to talk about are, are cash transfers. So in, uh, currently we pay social grants to about 16 million people in South Africa, most of them children. Um, it consumes about 3.3% 3, 3 of GDP, so one of the most generous uh, social transfer systems in, in the world. Very hard to see from that graph, um, particular graph, the, the distinction between market income, in other words, the income that you earn out, uh, from the labor market, from, uh, from, other, from, from sources outside of, of, of the fiscal system. Uh, so the orange part is, is market income, and the gray part that you can't see very well there is average income. If we, if we drill down and we just for a moment look at the bottom five deciles, what you see there is a very dramatic picture in terms of, of the share of income uh, to poorer households that is coming from cash transfers. So it makes a, 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 an extraordinarily large impact on poorer households. So these are well designed, they, 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 they pro-poor and they make a significant difference to, to incomes. Um, so the, the, I, I want to come back in a moment to this concept of market income. So, for, so if, you can, if you can think a little bit there about, about that little bit of orange there um, relative to the gray part. These are not entirely uh, um, honest simulations, maybe is, I'm not quite sure how to put that, but this, the simulation, <laughs> what we're doing here is, is saying if we were to rank households based purely on their market income without taking account of what they, or what they earn from, from, from social transfers, this is the ranking that we would see. Right? So we first do the ranking based just on that orange part of the graph and then we add in the gray. 
Now, in reality, that is not a scenario that would ever arise. If we were to wake up tomorrow morning and cash transfers cease to exist, these households, for the most part, would have to, would have to break down and, and reform with other households. It's simply unsustainable to think of households in the bottom, in the bottom decile continuing to survive on, on a few, few rand a month. So I, 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 that's a small caveat of, of, of this type of work. So we, could do, we can do a similar um, simulation of, of saying where does education spending go? So we, we, we take the household survey data and, and we drill down and look at, at, um, at the specifics of what goes on inside a household. So we can say in this particular household there is a child attending grade three school in this magisterial district. What does it cost the state to provide a child with grade three education in this magisterial district? And then we make this very big assumption of saying that is a that that cost of the state providing that service is a benefit to the household. So we, we are essentially saying that in the, if the household were to go out and purchase that, purchase that education with cash, this is the value of uh, that, this is what it would have to pay, therefore that's the value to the household. So we make no assumptions here about quality. Um, we don't talk about whether va households in fact value this, but uh, essentially we're saying we give, the state gives this to the household, and therefore that is the value that it has. So if you can um, put, put th that difficulty aside for one moment uh, and bear with me, then what you see here is a, is a pattern of education spending which is somewhat pro-poor. So poorer households, which also typically have, have, have somewhat more children in them, more, more children, especially in, in, primary, in primary schooling, um, do benefit more from, from, from state spending. One has this interesting anomaly right at the top of the distribution, and that's a story about higher education, that higher education is significantly more accessible to richer households, and it's extremely expensive. Um, so so, so it's, it's, there's an interesting, interesting story there about education spending. Healthcare spending, on the other hand, um, is, is, is more obviously pro-poor. So about 16% of South Africans have private medical aid and, and, and don't rely heavily on, 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 the, public, on the public sector um, and uh, on the public health system, and those are typically these households that, that, that you see at this end of the distribution. So very interesting um, work that um, I'm, I'm just trying to give you a taste of this evening. How does that then relate to what, what goes on in other countries? So, so what, do you, what do you have here? If you remember, I, I asked you to, to think about that, that little bit of, of the graph that was market income. If we were to calculate an, a Gini coefficient based purely on market income, we would have a Gini coefficient of about 0.77 for South Africa, compared to the, the Gini that we typically quote of 0.67, which is after direct taxes and after cash, cash transfers. If you're willing, willing to, to buy the, the story that education and health has a, 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 is appropriately valued in the way I described earlier, then you can calculate a Gini post-fiscus, post um, in other words, post the education and health spending, post-transfers, post all taxes, and the Gini goes all the way down to about 0.55. So a massive, a massive redistribution um, from, a, from, a, from a market Gini of 0.77 to a post-fiscal um, Gini of about 0.55. And so, what's it, so one of the things that's very attractive about this methodology that we apply, um, which comes from the Commitment to Equity Institute and uh, today and that, that Stan, Stan mentioned earlier, is that this, this very rigorous similar methodology is applied across a very large number of countries. And so that then means that we can draw comparisons with, with other middle-income countries, um, and, and what you see here is that the, 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 this bar here, the impact of, of fiscal redis redistribution is much larger in South Africa than any of the other countries um, that, 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 that we show here. So a, a, a significant redistribution happens via the state. But what you also need to bear in mind is that even after that happens, we still have a post-fiscal Gini, which is significantly higher than that for any of the other countries. So, Yes, some success in terms of fiscal redistribution, but nonetheless, one is still left with a, with a, um, a significant amount of, of, uh, of inequality. So that then neatly turns one to thinking, well, what, what does one then, how does one then think about the, this residual part of the inequality? And we know that the biggest part of that story lies in, in, in understanding the labor market. Sorry. So we can, we can do, um, we can, we can decompose the genie into income components. Um, 
It's something that we've, we've been doing for a very long time, um, going all the way back to the 1993 data. And if we do that, we, we find, and I won't describe the methodology, but what we find there is that about 85% or even 90% of inequality comes from the, comes from the labor market. Um, but what's interesting about this is, is, is that one, then, one can then decompose that further if you do some clever mathematics that Chris Willard figured out in 1995, um, you, can, you find that about one third of that inequality is actually not labor market inequality. It's, it's the result of a significant portion of about one third of households having no income. So we talk about it as though this is inequality, that this is earnings inequality, but in fact about a third of the story is not about earnings, it's purely about unemployment. And that's a, that's a, it's important then to think about these components of labor market inequality. There's inequality that comes from unemployment, there's inequality that comes from differentials in earnings. Um, yeah, so let me talk about those individually. So the, let's first think a little bit about the, 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 the inequality that, uh, that, that originates in unemployment. So we had new unemployment statistics ca that came out last week, quarter labor force came, survey came out, Lots of media attention around the fact that the, the unemployment rate has gone up to 29%. But this is not a new story. This is a long-run story. Uh, we, we, we act surprised when the unemployment statistics come out, but in fact, the, 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 there is nothing particularly new here. Um, it, it's, this, is a, this is a deep structural issue in, in, in the South African economy. So it's not enough just to talk about the fact that 29% of people are unemployed. There's also a very strong... Different groups are, are affected strongly differentially. So unemployment affects women more strongly, it affects younger people far more strongly, with a, typically with an unemployment rate almost double the, the overall unemployment rate, and it affects um, people from different, from different race groups in a highly differential way. So, so that's the first part of the puzzle, is, is the fact that at least one third of labor market inequality is, is, is an unemployment sto story, so therefore we know that the, so as part of that, the distribution of who gets a job clearly matters. Um, and so about, in about one third of households, nobody is working. So there is no labor market, there is simply no labor market connection in that household. Therefore when we think about policies that affect, for example, the national minimum wage or other policies aimed at, at, at raising incomes of poorer people, this one third of households are simply unaffected by those types of policies. Well, certainly not positively affected because there is nobody in those households that is, that is even connected to the labor market. And there's a very strong conne a connection between being unemployed and being poor, in other words, and, and, and you might say, well, why are you not talking about poverty? We're supposed to be talking about inequality. Being poor means you're in the, in the bottom part of the income distribution, therefore these things are, are, are clearly connected. So if you as an individual are unemployed, you have a 61% risk of being in poverty, of your household being in poverty. Remember, we think about poverty, we think about, we think about the income of the household, um, not of, of, of individuals differentially within that household. So your risk of being, of being poor is 61% if you're unemployed, um, and only 17% if, and only 17 if you are, 17 if you're employed. But quite interestingly, what one ends up with, if one looks at the number of people that are, um, that are poor, roughly equal numbers of people, of poor people are unemployed as are employed. And I think that's always quite a striking statistic just to think about the fact that therefore, this is partly an unemployment story that we need to address, but there are also significant numbers of, of, of working poor. And so this is based on a paper that um, Kezia Lillenstein, um, Mary Leibrandt and I wrote um, recently about that we also need to think about in work poverty. It's not simply the case that if you have a job, you automatically exit poverty. So not all jobs are equal. That's the second part of the labor market story. So the first point is who, who gets a job? Then even if you do get a job, not all jobs are, are, are the same. So your risk of being, of being poor, um, poor and in work significantly higher if you're a domestic worker or, working, or, or somebody else working in a private household. Um, much higher that if, you're, if you're a casual worker, and much lower if you're in the tertiary sector. So we know that there's a, there's a story here both about what happens in the, in the economy and, and not just amongst the unemployed. So this is, um, this is some new work that I've been doing together with uh, Iksan Basir, who's currently at the University of Massachusetts. 
where we, where we look at, well, what have earnings been doing over the last while? So if we, if we, if we say, okay, we understand that, there is, that the part of the story is, is about what actually happens in the labor market amongst people that have been working, we look at have diff what has been happening at different parts of the distribution since um, in, 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 the last, in the last 12 years or so. And so this is data that comes from um, the post-apartheid labor market series. So this is household survey data. I'm going to talk in a moment about different, different kind of data. But for now, this is household survey data. And one sees this very interesting picture where the bottom end of the distribution have seen quite high rates of growth or, or increases in, in, in earnings in the last period. Similarly, right at the top of the distribution, one also sees significantly high levels of growth. But people between those two extremes have done less well. So one certainly sees that, that, that there have been policies which have, which have worked hard to, to raise the incomes of lower income workers, but they haven't necessarily done anything to curb the very high income. Two other things I want to point out about this graph. The one is that it starts at the 60th percentile. And so that, the reason why it does that is because 60% of, of adults are not working, right? Which is quite a stunning statistic in the first place, right? That, the, we know now that the, labor, the last week's labor absorption ratio from Status A was 42%. In other words, 42% of people aged between 15 and 65 are in work. The other 60-odd percent are, are, have no attachment to the labor market and are earning absolutely nothing. So, this is a, so we do percentiles based on, on, on adults. 60% of adults have absolutely no income whatsoever, so they're simply not accounted for in, in this part of, of, of the picture. You also see that we, we stop the distribution at, a, at, a, at, you know, at about the 99th percentile. So we know that the household survey data is, is, is inadequate to, um, to, to address, uh, is, inadequately captures very high income individuals. Um, so let me talk a little, very briefly, um, about how might we find out more about the very top end of the distribution. So think about if you if you are to collect a house if you go out into the field and you collect a household and you collect household survey data, you unlikely to, to to get enough data about very rich people for a number of reasons. The first is that being very rich is quite a rare event. So if you if you if you run if you do a, a survey amongst just ten thousand households or thirty thousand households, you're probably not going to pick up a great many very rich people. Even if your sample is such that you should have captured some very rich people, the chances are not good that they were willing to participate in your survey. Very rich people are not home during the day, they, uh, they live in gated communities, and their time is very expensive. If you show up at their door and, and tell them that you're planning on, on administering a five-hour survey, which is how long the NID survey sadly takes, um, it's unlikely that they're going to participate. So, so for the last while, we've been, we, we, we wave our hands a great deal and we say, well, we don't really know what's going on right at the top of the distribution. Happily, um, in the last while, we've been able to get access to, to tax records from, from SARS, so assessment data from, from individuals that are required to file. Um, and so we've got data at the moment just for two years, 2011 and 2014. Um, but based on that data, Again, people then typically say, well, how do we know that people report accurately to SARS? Well, one has to, you know, one has to start somewhere. I think uh, you know, SARS, SARS for the last while has certainly been um, viewed as, um, as all-knowing and, um, and, and quite um, draconian in, 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 their, uh, in, in how they respond if, if you don't submit your, taxes, your tax return. So we, we think that this data is, is, is reasonably good. So we think it's, this is now an opportunity to start thinking about is there a way in which we can, we can think about household survey data as perhaps being good enough for some part of the distribution and then the tax record data is, as, as being um, better for some other part of the distribution. And so we've started doing, doing work in which we try and stitch these two distributions together. It turns out not to be straightforward. It's, you have to, have to make all sorts of decisions about what's the best place to stitch them together. Um, but it's a, it's an ex these are exciting new avenues of work for us. In addition to the tax assessment data, it turns out SARS actually published quite a lot of information. So they publish a, a, something called the tax statistics. There are, there are lots of people from the School of Accountancy here this evening. You would have seen SARS as tax statistics. They actually provide very detailed information for 24 income categories. Um, so and, and if you this graph here is based purely on, on, on the published SARS data. And from the published SARS data, we can actually, we can actually draw, draw some distributions about what is happening at, um, 
for at least the top 5% of, of, of individuals. So the, um, to give you some sense of, of where is the 95th percentile of individuals, remember 60% of individuals earn nothing, um, and, then, and then earnings start at the 60th percentile. The 95th percentile starts at about 400,000 rand a year. Um, so it, uh, typically people uh, find, find that a little hard to believe. So the 95th percentile is at 400,000. The 99th percentile, all right, so people that, that end up in the top 1% starts um, at just under a million rand per annum in current prices. And the top 0.1% starts just at about 2.8 million. Okay, so just to give you some sense. So, so, so based on the published SARS, uh, the, the tabulations that SARS publishes, we can, we can draw some growth incidence curves. So similar to earlier when I said how much of income's changed by over time. So we can do that for the 95th percentile. And we periodize this to, to the period prior to the, the, the financial crisis and after the financial crisis. The blue line is the average growth in national income over that time period. So what you see here is that everybody in the top 5% has done somewhat better than, than the average South African in terms of the growth of their income, but those at the top have done significantly better um, than anybody else, and that's true in both periods. So it's an interesting story in terms of, of how you of, of seeing the, this pulling away right at the top of the income distribution. You see that that over time there's been um, the, just whether you talk about the period before or after the financial financial crisis. Um, there, there have been differential gains to, differ, to different groups. So again, we can, we can, uh, we can then think about income shares. Um, so if you, if you look over here, what you see, this is 2003, this is 2015. The, the share of income going to the top 1% of the distribution has grown from about 8.5% in 2003 to, to over 12% in 2015. So again, not only... so. And, I mean, it, it, it has to be true that if there's been a pulling away from the, from the, from the median of the distribution, um, it has to be true that that share of income is growing. But a, a remarkable result that more than 12% of income is going to just 1% 1 of, of people. So exciting new avenues um, in terms of using, using the tax data. So I said earlier one can then try and, and, and stitch these distributions together and say, well, can we combine these things in some way? Um, so in a recent paper with Janina Hundenborn um, and, and Jan Jeremer, we've done exactly that. And we get this, this, this result, which they found disappointing. I think it's a fantastic result. So we find that the Gini coefficient on earnings, so now we're not talking about households, and that's why suddenly this is much higher. This is just for people that do earn something, uh, that, that, uh, for, for, for adults and just based on their individual earnings. The Gini moves from 0.82 to 0.83. And they said, well, that's not a very exciting paper. I was like, but what does it say? It says the household survey data, which I've put so much love into collecting, is actually pretty, is actually pretty good. Um, and so for me, that was, a, that was a happy result. But, but I do think that there, there's still some interesting stories to be told about the, the very, very top. It just turns out that, of course, the very, very top is, is a small number of people. So it doesn't actually, it doesn't do much in terms of shifting the genie, even when we, when, even when we managed, managed to measure it very accurately. So where does this leave, where does this, all of this leave us? Either as academic researchers who work on inequality, or as concerned individuals who would like to make a contribution to reducing the unacceptably high levels of inequality. As researchers, inadequately answered questions remain about the roles and importance of assets and wealth in perpetuating the high levels of inequality. The new work, some of which I showed you this evening, on the very top end of the income and earnings distribution shows very clearly that those at the top end have flourished even in times of low overall economic growth. They've done this by being able to draw on a far broader array of income sources and physical, financial, and human assets. But we need to know much more about exactly how that wealth is transferred across generations and more generally much more about social mobility. Another key question that remains inadequately answered is why the South African labor market continues to display such extraordinary levels of unemployment. That requires a much better grasp of the demand for labor in conjunction with more sophisticated understanding of market structure and market power. I think many of us have done a great deal of work now on the labor supply story, but we've got a very inadequate story in South Africa about, the, about labor, labor demand. So 
Empirically, we now know some things about, about what drives unemployment that unfortunately doesn't take us very far in terms of, of then knowing exactly what it is that we do about it. And so the literature tells us that in fact, there, that this is not something that you can solve in a, in a, in a simple way through fiscal measures. The, the inequality has, has extremely deep drivers that are very hard to change. Inequality has a particular path dependency. It, it doesn't, it's not as though we woke up this morning and we had a particular economy. This comes from, from hundreds and hundreds of years of history and, um, and, and, and societal um, design. Very deep-seated social stratification sustains inequality. And again, how does one start to think about, about addressing those issues? There are norms regarding inequality and, um, which, uh, which, uh, which need to be addressed if one's going to and, and ultimately, that, that then turns into being about societal choices, which ultimately become political choices. We know that there's a strong link between economic and political inequality. We know that social movements matter considerably. Countries that have made inroads into, into inequality reduction have also been countries where, where social movements have, um, have been very strong. And finally, we know that demographic dynamics exacerbate inequality, and that's something I think that's very underexplored in this country. We have very few people working on, on demography, and particularly on economic demography. And so what I think this all points to is that, is that there is, the economists paint a very partial picture of a particular part of the story, but it's only going to be through true collaborative work with people from other disciplines, the political scientists, the sociologists, the historians, um, the demographers, that we're going to start to think about a, a, a how do we really start to address these issues? So a great deal has happened in the, in the realm of measurement, um, but the question now becomes, now what? And so I want to leave you with this um, rather fabulous quote from Professor Ben Chirac um, in, a, in a paper he wrote this year uh, entitled, South Africans should not be polite about inequality. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Given her wisdom and all-round general pleasantness, we are therefore delighted <laughs> to have Ingrid join our department as a professor. We also want Ingrid to know that if she ever tires of being the dean, <laughs> she will have a very happy academic home in the economics department uh, for her important, well-regarded and high-impact research and policy work. And this would enable us to have more coffee more regularly <laughs> with Ingrid, <laughs> which I think we we'll all appreciate. Speaking of which, uh, on behalf of the Department of Economics and also the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, I now welcome you to enjoy snacks and wine to celebrate Ingrid's inaugural uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you.